Okay, hello friends, and welcome to an exciting Chagura public shiur. Today we have the privilege of hearing from Rabbi Dr. Harvey Belowski on Spinoza and his encounter with the works of Rambam and Ibn Ezra, a little bit our speaker. Rabbi Belowski has been Rabbi Boulder's Green Synagogue since 2003. He read mathematics at University College Oxford, received semicha from Gates at Yeshiva, and holds postgraduate degrees from the University of London in organizational psychology and hermeneutics. He is chief strategist and rabbinic lead of University Jewish Chaplaincy, principal of Rimon Jewish Primary School, among other roles. He has authored four books and is a regular live contributor to BBC Radio 2. He's married to Vicky, a journalist whom he met at Oxford. Uh, they have seven beautiful children and a granddaughter. Uh, for those who are new to the Chabura, welcome. Uh, we are happy you are here with us. Uh, we are a physical and virtual Bet Midrash with members from around the world committed, committed to a sophisticated and authentic Torah. Aside from our cutting edge weekly members and public shiurim given by impressive chachamim and scholars, we have live events, a publishing house, a journal, and a vibrant virtual network. Uh, this Sunday, we will be presenting our new curriculum and opening the opportunity to sign up for new membership. Uh, so stay tuned for that and uh, make sure to join and uh, take full advantage of the new curriculum, which will be launched on September. Uh, with that said, tonight's shiur will be recorded and available later on our website. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and please, God, there will also be some time for questions at the end. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining um, us this uh, special public shiur. And Rabbi Belovsky, thank you so much for being here with us, and the floor is yours. Good evening, um, and thank you for that very fulsome introduction um, and profile. It could even be that I wrote it myself, uh, much appreciated and a particular thanks to Sina in London and of course Rabbi Dweck for encouraging me to um, join this Chabura and to present a shield to you. And I chosen a very slightly controversial subject. I'm going to display a text in a moment and the text will be available to you as well. Co controversial because it focuses around the interaction between one man and some classic Jewish texts, which is not always well known. This man is Benedict or Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza, who lived in the 17th century, was a, a Dutch philosopher who came from Portuguese, uh, esteemed fa Jewish family. Um, and by the time he was in his early 20s, his questioning and his ideas and what was deemed downright heresy by the Jewish leaders of the community led to what is probably the most famous echerem excommunication um, in modern Jewish history to the extent that even today, and even in quite modern parts of the Sephardi community, his name is unmentionable. I actually saw Rabbi Dweck um, last night, I sat with him at Mincha, and he said that in his shul, he may not mention Spinoza, I don't know how serious he is about that, but I understand he became a byword for a kind of anti-Jewish progressivism within the Jewish world. His writings are really the beginning of a kind of modern alternative to a religious way of thinking. And some have even said he's the first secular person because people changed religions, but they didn't really not have a religion um, in, a, in a traditional way. Spinoza is famous or infam infamous for all of these things. However, what I'm gonna speak about this evening is not the history and influence of Spinoza, but the interface between Spinoza and two of the greatest of all time, the great medieval writers, of course, writing many hundreds of years before Spinoza um, lived, but he refers to their writings in his, in places that are not well known, creating an influence and impact that is equally um, little known. I'm going to now um, share the text and I'm gonna focus for the next 40 minutes or so on this text. Let's just hope this all works. I wonder what's very, some hostage to the, to the text as you can see, this works very nicely. And um, um, here we go. So for some reason, I'm not able to see my little box of tricks. So I can't highlight the text for you, but I hope you can see it. The title is When Spinoza Met the Rabbis, Two Encounters That Changed the World. I'm going to divide what I'm going to say into two sections, both of which are supported by the text. Encounter A, Spinoza meets the Ibn Ezra, 
And this is a conversation around divine authorship of the Torah, which is, of course, a given in all traditional circles that the Torah is a divine document, ideas, a text even communicated by God to Moshe and handed down faithfully subsequently. Different people, of course, have a slightly different understanding of how this works, but that's the principle. In a theological political treatise, as it's known, it was written in Latin, so these are all translations, which was published in 1670, which is about seven years before Spinoza died. And there were translations, as you can see, this translation is about 200 years after Spinoza's death. Spinoza starts to talk about what he regards as an untrue principle, a principle that there is some kind of revelation from the divine. His understanding of God, if it can be said to be God, is a much more universalist God. It's a much more earthly God in that there is no revelation, there is no content of a special relationship, and there is certainly no idea of a divine text which commands human beings how to behave. In this text, he says as follows, in the former chapter, and we are hostage again to the translation, but we'll manage. We treated of the foundations and principles of scriptural knowledge and showed that it consists solely in the trustworthy history of the sacred writings. Such a history, in spite of its indispensability, the ancients neglected, meaning the text is human constructed and it has a history. Or at any rate, whatever they may have written or handed down has perished in the lapse of time, meaning evidence of an assembly of documents, a little like the later documentary hypothesis uh, promoted by Wilhausen and others in the 19th century. But any evidence of earlier documents, that's disappeared. Consequently, the groundwork for such an investigation is to a great extent cut from under us, meaning I can't prove my version of events as how the terror came about. This might be put up with if succeeding generations had confined themselves within the limits of truth and had handed down conscientiously what few particulars they had received or discovered without any additions from their own brains. As it is, the history of the Bible is not so much imperfect as untrustworthy. He is, of course, talking about the traditional understanding of the origins, authenticity and authority of the Torah as understood by Jews and as an aside by many Christians, because it's also true to say that the Catholic Church was deeply unhappy with the writings of Spinoza. Um, and soon after Spinoza's death, um, his writings were added to what's known um, the, to the, as the infamous index, which was a list of books banned by the Catholic Church. So this could easily so far be attacked on other um, understandings, other religious understandings of the significance and sanctity of the Torah. The foundations are not only too scanty for building on, but are also unsound. It is part of my purpose to remedy these defects and to remove common theological prejudices. But I fear that I'm attempting my task too late. The men have arrived at the pitch of not suffering contradiction, but defending obviously whatever they have adopted under the name of religion. Meaning that people are too far gone they're so immersed in their beliefs, they can't really see the truth. So widening out these prejudices, taking possession of men's minds, that very few, comparatively speaking, will listen to reason. However, I will make the attempt and spare no efforts, for there is no positive reason for despairing of success. In order to treat the subject methodologically, I will begin with received opinions concerning the true authors of the sacred books, and in the first place, speak of the author of the Pentateuch, who is almost universally supposed to be Moses. The Pharisees, by which he means the rabbinic Jewish world. This is not how Jews refer to, to the rabbinic world, but that is a Christian way of understanding it. We'll go with it. Purushim, as they would be called in Hebrew, are so firmly convinced of his identity, they account as a heretic anyone who differs from them on the subject. Wherefore, and here we meet the Ibn Ezra, he calls him Aben Ezra, but as we know, he is called Rav Avraham Ibn Ezra. Ibn is Arabic for son, so he's called Avram, son of Ezra, known to Spinoza as Abin Ezra, but we know who he's talking about. A man of enlightened intelligence and no small learning, who was the first, so far as I know, to treat of this opinion, meaning that he doubted, according to Spinoza, whether the account in traditional Jewish sources of divine authorship is in fact true, dare not express his meaning openly but confined himself to dark hints, which I shall not scruple to elucidate, thus throwing full light on the subject. Meaning the Ibn Ezra knew really that the Torah wasn't divine, but he was a bit nervous to write it, so he couched his views in rather opaque terms. The words of the Ibn Ezra, which occur in his commentary on Deuteronomy, are as follows beyond Jordan. 
if it so be that thou understand the mystery of the twelve, and we'll come back to this, because I'm going to show you shortly the actual text in the Ibn Ezra. If you understand the mystery of the twelve, moreover, Moses wrote the law, the, and, and he quotes various, and various verses, you shall know the truth. The truth, which Spinoza understands to be, that Ibn Ezra does not think the Torah is divinely written. In these few words he hints, and also showed that it was not Moses who wrote the Pentateuch, but someone who lived long after him and further, that the book which Moses wrote was something different from any now extant. To prove this, I say, he draws attention to the facts. And these are a paraphrase of some sections of the Ibn Ezra. I'm not gonna read all of it. One, the preface to Devarim could not have been written by Moshe, in much he never crossed the Jordan. That the whole book of Moses was written at length on the circumference of a single altar. There are various details in the story which he believes validates what he thinks to be the Ibn Ezra's position on the divinity of the Torah. Let's go to the next text. There's rather a lot of this. I'm certainly not going to read all of it. And there's a whole long list, which you can read at your leisure, of various sections of the text, which he believes demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that the text is of a later origin, edited later. And now if you go to the penultimate paragraph, we have thus made clear the meaning of Ibn Ezra and also the passages of the Pentateuch, which he cites in proof of his contention. And in fact, if you just look at the paragraph above, he quotes a section about the king and the bed. It's a very strange verse in Devorim Gimel, Deuteronomy 3, about, about the bed of Oig. And he says here, this passage, I say, inserted to explain the words of Moses, which precedes it. This is citing the Ibn Ezra. What is going on here? What does it mean? However, Ibn Ezra does not call attention to every instance or even the chief ones. There may be many of greater importance. So those are just the ones Ibn Ezra mentioned. And here's a load of others Spinoza identifies himself, which suggest later and perhaps composite authorship. And here you go. I, one, that the writer of the books in question not only speaks of Moses in the third person, but also bears witness to many details concerning him. For instance, Moses talked with God, the Lord spoke with Moses face to face, and so on and so forth. Moses, the man of God, Moses, the servant, etc., etc. As far as Ibn Ezra is concerned, all these details, talks about the end of Moses' life, all these details, the manner of narration, the testimony, the context of the whole story, lead to the plain conclusion that these books were written by another and not by Moses in person. So what I would like to do is to kind of pause and see what, Ibn, what the Spinoza has done. In his later philosophical tract, published soon before he dies, he asserts that it is plain and obvious that the story of divine authorship, the traditional narrative and understanding of the origin, authenticity, and therefore authority of the Torah, is highly dubious. Not only is it highly dubious, and it is clearly a, a human created document of much later origin, which, by the way, does not mean Spinoza rejects it as valuable, but completely downgrades its significance, something which will be completely untenable within an orthodox framework. But in order to see, he said, don't think I've made this up. A man as great as the Ibn Ezra, one of the greatest Sfaradi, Torah commentator of the medieval period, he also held this, but it was so controversial that he could not do what I've done. He couched it in very vague terms, the secret of the 12, something to be quiet about, something you don't know about. What is this really talking about? Has Spinoza got it right? Does the Ibn Ezra actually claim that the Torah is not divine? Is that possible? And if not, then what is he talking about? So in a moment or a few minutes, I'm going to show you some excerpts from the Ibn Ezra and I think demonstrate that Spinoza misread them. Whether he misread them willfully or accidentally is unclear. There is no question, given the traditional uh, Jewish upbringing and um, facility he must have had with Hebrew texts, he was more than capable of reading the Ibn Ezra in the original, so it's unlikely he read them um, in translation. But before we do that, I want to show you a piece which is the introduction of someone called Rabbi Shmuel David Lutzato, an Italian rabbi from the, from the mid 19th century called Shadal, which you can see is um, an acronym for his name, Shin Dalad Lamad, Shmuel David Lutzato. So in his introduction to Devorim, Shadal lays into, 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 into Spinoza, attacks him mercilessly, 
ואחר אשר בדור הזה, כבר ניס פשטו ספרי שפינוזה בעולם. Since in this generation, the books of Spinoza have already widely spread across the world. And they have already been now been translated into Western European languages. I think by Russian Ashkenazi probably means German rather than Yiddish, but it means, most importantly, that Jews who cannot read Latin, the vast majority of Jews never read Latin, have now got access to these works, which means they are a threat in a way they were not previously. So by the time Shavat is writing, 1850, 1860, sorry, sorry, Luzzato is, um, Shadal, who is Luzzato, is writing in the mid 19th century. These, the works of Spinoza and his ideas, which he regards as toxic, these works are now available in Western European languages. Kuvar, Nuchtavdu, and we're now we're seeing people praising this man, this Spinoza, even in Hebrew, and all this has resulted in many people reading his books, even amongst the Jewish community, even, even simple people, meaning not just philosophers who might have the capacity to consider and argue with these ideas, but even amongst ordinary people who may actually come to be influenced by them. Because of this, I am compelled. And Shadal is known for this, that suddenly he'll go into Italian or Latin and he'll put the words in as he needs, um, usually in Roman characters, I am a forced to expose the lies and falsehoods that Spinoza wrote at the beginning of chapter eight of the Tractatus. But Omer, when he said, Ki Rav Avram ben Ezra, that's the Ibn Ezra, Kosov Beremes, hinted in writing, Ki lo Moshe Kosov Sefer Torah, and Moshe never wrote the Sefer Torah. Look how he frames it, Sheker of a Koz, buzz of lies and deceit. This is what Spinoza wrote about Ibn Ezra. They name Emes. The truth is, Avram bin Ezra, Ramaz Derech Soid, he did indeed hint, Ki yesh sas mikroyas noisvim achrei mois moshe. The Ibn Ezra hints that there are in the Torah a small number of verses that were added after the death of Moshe. And it's important to understand. For the Rambam, this will be very controversial. The Rambam says explicitly that there is no possibility of what I would call post-Mosaic editions. He said, but that's what the Ibn Ezra says. There's a small number of verses that were, read, that were added after the death of Moshe. But there is not the slightest trace in any of his writings to, to even suspect there's not the slightest evidence that the Ibn Ezra believed that Moshe did not write the book. And when he talks about the, the secret of the Twelve, remember this is something which, which we saw Spinoza referred to. And if you understand the secret of the Twelve, he's quoting all these verses. What does this mean? He says, without reading every word of the section from Shadal, that there's a, there are a handful of verses, and he'll explain why, which he believed were edited in by prophets, maybe only by Yehoshua, by Joshua. But the suggestion that that can be extended to the entire book is complete nonsense, deceit and lies, and has no trace and no validity whatever. And... If you look what he says at the bottom, I don't want to spend too much time reading this. Aval Spinoza, the very last section of text before we move on to item three. Apart from the fact his research is flawed. Ein sofik shaygam kein. Do I believe volev of a kam makomis atoyes kolog v'arum on birum? He said, I have no doubt at all, but that madaber believe volev, meaning literally he speaks in heart and heart, meaning he is a cheat, that there are many, the Hitor Eskorov, there are many places where he deliberately deceives 
his reader, meaning he does not believe this is an innocuous error, a misreading. He believes that Spinoza deliberately misreads this, the Ibn Ezra in a deceitful and destructive way to try to give a false support in early sources to his version of the authorship of the Torah. May God have mercy on those who read his books and may their eyes be opened to recognize his lies. So he pulls no punches. He's very clear. And he is indeed right. And I hope we'll be able to demonstrate this in the few minutes that remain of this section of the class. So here we have, this is, a, this is a verse in Vayishlach, the long genealogy of the family of Esau is followed by a shorter section about the kings, um, the, uh, about, um, about ancient kings. Yesh Omrim says the Ibn Ezra, there are those who say, So he said, some say this was written with prophecy, meaning it's written later or with some kind of prophecy about a later era. Yitzchaki Oma Basifroi, and Yitzchaki, I'll explain who Yitzchaki is in a moment. Yitzchaki writes in his book, that this section was written in the day much later of King Yehoshaphat. So he says, Do you understand why it's called Yitzchak? Because Yitzchak means laughter, because everyone will laugh and mock someone who says this. Totally unacceptable. Yitzhaki was a Karaite. Ibn Ezra has a, uh, let's say, I would say a, a strange relationship with the Karaites because he, he admires their grammar, their ability to read the text extremely accurately, but despises their rejection of the oral tradition. And here he's saying that Yitzhaki doesn't what he's talking about. It's preposterous and totally unacceptable to say this. Here's an, here we go a little bit more. So he, we have here, um, I'm going to read this. Vayal Moshe me arvois moyav el harnavoi. And Moshe ascended from the plains of Moab to Mount Navoi, Rosh HaPisgah. This is the beginning of the last chapter of the Torah, chapter 34 of Devorim. Rosh HaPisgah to the tip of the summit. Ashel Pnei facing Jericho. Vayareo Hashem es kol ha'oret. And the Lord showed him all of the land. Es ha'gilod. The Gilad Ad done as far as done, says the Ibn Ezra Lafidati, according in my opinion, Yeshua. From this verse onwards, and how many verses are there in chapter 34, the last chapter of the Torah? There are 12. The last 12 verses were written Yeshua. You can't write about your own death. And there is just by way of conversation in the in a Gomorrah in Baba Basra, a conversation about the last eight verses about whether Moshe wrote them with prophecy and crying as he wrote them, or they were added by Yeshua. So it's clearly a valid view, although it's interesting the Ibn Ezra extends it to the whole of the chapter. He after Moshe ascended, he didn't write anything. They were written by prophecy by Yeshua, i.e., they have prophetic standards. Gum by Hashem, love gum. All these verses that follow were written by Yeshua, describing the events of Moshe in an authorized prophetic version. But the key source that the Ibn Ezra quoted is the next one on the second verse of the Book of Devorim. Achad They are currently eleven days' journey from Chorev. That is the um, that is the poetic name for Mount Sinai. Derech Haraseir on the route to Mount Seir, Ad Kodesh Barnea, as far as Kodesh, let's tell you what they are, Kodesh Barnea. Says the Ibn Ezra, I've already told they're on route after the, after, the, after, the, after the spies. There were no mitzvahs until the 40th year. We see in the verses that Moshe began to explicate the Torah. It says where he was speaking. The majority of the mitzvahs in the Torah are in Devorim. So he explains the concept where they are. They're in the desert. They're in the plain. Now the key bit. We are on the last three words of the third line of this text. And if you understand the secret of the twelve, 
But you know what the secret of the 12 now is? The secret of the 12 is that the last 12 verses of the Torah, according to the Ibn Ezra, were added by Yeshua with, with prophecy, i.e. a very small post-Mosaic prophetic edition in a place where it could not have been written by Moshe. If you understand the secret now, for the Ibn Ezra, this may have been controversial. As Spinoza said, he concealed it, but not for the reason that Spinoza said, because somehow the Ibn Ezra, God forbid, believed the Torah was not divine, but because it was an unpopular, perhaps for an ordinary audience, difficult to digest. Here's a few verses that Moshe wrote, it's reporting afterwards. The Kanani were then in the land, the Canaanite, that's talking when Avram enters the land in the 12th chapter of Bereshis. So, he was then in the land. It's an explanatory note added by Yeshua, right? And Bahar Hashem Yeroeh, that's talking about um, the, the nature of the mountain in which the Akedah was taking place. The Hine Arsoi Eris Barzel. If you, and behold, the bed of Oig was made of iron. And these are all details which Moshe couldn't have known. And according to the Ibn Ezra, not, by, not the Rambam, according to the Ibn Ezra, they were added later by Yeshua. And how do you know this? Take your emiss, you'll know the truth. You have to piece it together. There are a small number of verses which the Ibn Ezra believes that Yeshua wrote with prophecy and added offers, and that is all. And this has been distorted by Spinoza into saying the Ibn Ezra is a support for my progressive view that the Torah was in fact a much later document. And as you can see, this is not true. And this thing about being, being silent, the Ibn Ezra in the last excerpt, I don't, I don't want, I want to go on to the next one, so we're not going to read it all, um, mentions when it comes to the Canaanites in the land, if you understand this, a muscle you don't, somebody who understands will remain silent because it's very hard to digest. So I think we've now seen when Spinoza encountered the Ibn Ezra, we ended up, as it were, he utilised, according to Shadal, maliciously, a very, very limited post-mosaic edition and somehow distorted this into an Ibn Ezra whom Ibn Ezra himself would not recognize in support of what is without question uh, um, uh, uh, an unacceptable way of understanding the origins of the Torah. Just for your interest to finish this section I've got an ironic afterword and a segue to future study the Chidor the great Azulai writing in the mid 18th century one of the, the great one of the greatest Sfaradi thinkers of that era and he oddly quotes someone here called Harav bin Yamin Ispinoza, who is not, who is not Bog Spinoza, maybe a relative. And he, he says that, by the way, when the Ibn Ezra is claimed to have said that there were post-Mosaic verses, it's a fraud. The text isn't real. Don't believe it. Something's gone wrong. It's something which was added in by bad people after the Ibn Ezra died. I'm not convinced by this. I think by this stage, the Rumbum's view has become so... Um, so dominant that people find it very difficult to accept that other sources have a slightly different view. What is clear is that the Ibn Ezra's, the Ibn Ezra does not in any way support Spinoza, and Spinoza in, in counsel with Ibn Ezra enabled him to promote in the name of great rabbis an outlook and perspective on the Torah which cannot be squared or reconciled with any kind of traditional approach. That is part one. Here's part two. Encounter B, Spinoza meets the Rumbum, what I've called universalism and the Noahide codes. So here we have one of perhaps the most vexatious texts um, in the Rumbum. The Rumbum speaks in chapters at nine and 10 of his Laws of Kings, which are very, very close to the end of the Yad, his Mishnah Torah. They talk about the, not the seven mitzvahs which compromise the Noahide codes and in the in the in the first section here which I'm not going to read it this one they are um, idolatry blasphemy murder um, um, uh, it, sexual immorality theft and dinim which means to have courts that regulate these rules and in the time of Noah um, after the flood um, Adam and Achai that one is allowed to eat an animal but then one treats it in a certain way now, what is the nature of these rules? This is the universal code of all humanity, and this is the vexations and controversial rumbum. The next one, call ham kabel sheva mitzvahs. Anyone who accepts the seven mitzvahs, this is talking about non-Jews, the nishor la asoson, and is particular to observe them, 
Harizem Echasidu Umsoilom. This is a person who is one of the righteous um, uh, or pious of the nations of the world. And such a person merits a portion in the afterlife. So far, so good. Bougie Kabul, now it gets difficult. This is the bit that's really bothered people. Bougie Kabul Osan, the Asa Osan. But that's provided that the person receives, accepts them, and performs them. Because God commanded them in the Torah. Odiano Ali de Moshe Rabbeinu and made them known to us through Moshe Rabbeinu. Shebenei Noach, we called him in its love. That the previously that these that the Noach had come first. That they'd always that these laws had existed before. Ah, oh, that's a bit of a problem if you're an ethical Gentile living in a place where you now encounter Jews or the Torah. Aval, and here's the underlined bit. But if you do them because of you, you've kind of worked them out on your own, they just seem sensible. Such a person is not a ger toshov. A ger toshov here is a, an indigenous Gentile person who is not Jewish, but lives a moral life according to the, the, according to the Noahide Code. The olom, the Such a person is not one of the, one of the pious of the, of the nations of the world, nor one of their wise men. And this has caused a great deal of upset. Look what Spinoza does with this. And again, in the Tractatus Theological Politicus, he has a section called Universalism and Natural Law. He believes in the concept of natural law. There are ideas which are universal, which for which a revelatory origin has been made up to give them validity. But he believes that these laws are universal and not particular, i.e. they plead to the whole of humanity, a moral code, and they apply equally to Jews and non-Jews, and the Jews have sort of made up a kind of revelation narrative to A, particularize them, to make the laws apply to Jews and not to non-Jews, but B, to make, give them a sort of fake authenticity. That is Spinoza's understanding of the Torah. And it is his angst and anger about this idea is generated by the rumbum that we just read. Here are some excerpts from Spinoza. Chapter four of the divine law. From lack of knowledge, the Decalogue in, in relation to the Hebrews was a law. For since they knew not the existence of God as an eternal truth, this is what Spinoza understands. His concept of God is some kind of notion of eternal truth, not a God as a creator, not in the way the Rambam understand, not the way we understand. It's no question that his understanding of God is not one that we can square or reconcile with Jewish beliefs. They didn't know that. They were too primitive to understand that God was an eternal truth, they must have taken as a law that which was revealed to them in the Decalogue, namely that God exists and that God only should be worshipped. So these are, in his view, made up concepts. And if God had spoken to them without the intervention of any bodily means, immediately they would not have, have perceived it not as a law, but as an eternal truth. What we have said about the Israelites and Adam applies also to all the prophets who wrote laws in God's name. They did not adequately conceive God's decree as eternal truth, meaning they imagined some kind of revelation. But all they were really doing was recording eternal truths, which are just part of the fabric, natural laws, which are just part of the fabric of existence. For instance, we must say of Moses that from revelation, from the basis of what was revealed to him, he perceived the method by which the Israelitish nation could best be united in a particular territory. So Moses was a clever con man that he realized that the best way to preserve a nation was to give them a land and could form a body political state. And further, he perceived the method by which that nation could best be constrained to obedience. How do you control the people? You provide them the law. How do you get them to keep the law? You tell them that God has told them to do it. And if they don't do it, bad things will happen. This is how it works. 65, wherefore he perceived these things, not as eternal truths, but as precepts and ordinances. I, what he wishes to do is to remove the notion of a metzaver, a commander, and a metzaver, with the commanded. This is not part of, um, this is not part of Spinoza's worldview. And it also turns the laws into universal concepts and eternal truths, rather than particular precepts and ordinances. And he ordained them as laws of God. That's what Moshe did with these rules, because he either deliberately concealed or didn't understand where they'd really come from. And thus it came to be that he conceived God as ruler, a legislator, a king, as merciful, just, whereas such qualities are simply attributes of human nature and utterly alien from the nature of the deity, meaning they are projected. So, You'll be pleased to hear this is the last page of the sources. He has a little more of this because at the moment he hasn't yet turned his ire to the rumba. 
In the following chapter of the Tractatus, Spinoza says of the ceremonial law, the Jews are of a directly contrary way of thinking, right? Jews are contrarians. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't think in a good way. They don't think in a logical and sensible way, for they hold the true opinions and the true plan of life are of no service in attaining blessedness. If their possessors have arrived at them by the light of reason only, and not like the documents Professor Uriva revealed to Moses. You see where this is going. This is already now paraphrased. He's going to quote the Rambam very shortly. But you can see, if you don't get them from God, he said the Jews have gone so far with this idea that if you observe them or believe in them, because you've come across them on your own or believe them to be eternal truth, that's no good. You, could, you only get any credit if you believe them because God revealed them, which is an inversion of the truth as far as Spinoza is concerned. Maimonides ventures openly to make this assertion. Every man, and now I'm not going to read it again, this is a translation, which is of course Spinoza's translation into Latin from the Hebrew of the Rambam, then translated back into English in the late 19th century, but as you can see, he quotes this actually the same section from chapter eight of Hilchus Malachim, which we saw on the previous page. Just to remind you, it's over here, this section here, the last bit that I underlined. But in the, in the middle of section 89, it only works if he understands them because God ordained them in the law and revealed them to us from Moses because they are a four-time priestess, the son of Noah. But he who follows them as led thereto by reason is not counted as a dweller among the pious or among the wish nations of the nation, of wise of the nations. And this is the very root of his disregard for Judaism. If this is what Judaism is, it's an inversion of the truth. It's a, a kind of parochial um, particularism which speaks not to him at all. Such are the words of Maimonides, which Yosef, the son of Shem Tov, Yosef, um, I think that's Yosef Tuvilaim, adds in his book, which he calls Kavod Elohim, that although Aristotle, whom he considers to have written the Beth Exodus to be above everyone else, has not omitted anything that concerns true ethics, and which he has adopted in his own book, carefully following the lines laid down, yet this was not able to suffice for salvation. Even the great Aristotle could not be saved, inasmuch as he embraces doctrines in accordance with the dictates of reason and not divine documents, Professor Urigal, which Spinoza regards as utterly preposterous, that, that even Aristotle didn't make it. Aristotle didn't make it because he may have been a moral, ethical person, one of the greatest teachers, pedagogues, genius, writer of ethics, but he did not believe these rules because they were divine command. As far as the Rambam is concerned, he doesn't make it. And it's, it seems to me, looking reasonably in the lines, that this was something which was seminal in Spinoza's turn away from Judaism, this idea that, this, that there was no merit for anyone unless it came through revelation, whereas he believed these ideas were, were somehow eternal ethical principles, eternal truths applicable to the whole of humanity. That is critical that the, the, the Spinoza saw this in the Rambam and used it as a platform, used it as, as it were, as a springboard for what became a whole content of eternal truth instead of God, a notion of a sort of universal truth rather than revelation, and so a total inversion of the core principles of Judaism by which particularism is required in order to create a mole model nation, an orla goyim. The trouble is, and these are the, re the remaining texts in the class, there's something which, which Spinoza missed, that on this occasion, he's forgiven because he couldn't have known it. In the first case, it would appear that he either carelessly or more likely maliciously misused the Ibn Ezra. Here is rather different. Here is a short excerpt from a book which is a favorite of mine, near the end of a book called Missinai Lishkata Gazit, which is a book written maybe 12, 15 years ago, um, a modern book discussing the Rambam, Maimonides, Rambam Nachmanides. al Sifo on the threshold of a new era. A really kind of cataclysmic conversation emerged over the words of the Rambam. Why is someone, why is the portion, the outcome for someone who comes to these ethical principles and ideas, these mitzvahs, on his own, through his own self-illumination. Why is that so inferior? 
because Bota Baruch Zohar Hishmiya Baruch Spinoza and Spinoza um, engage in a particularly harsh, um, if you like, investigational critique of this topic. Ladasa, in his view, Hakor Hativis Shelo MS, natural understanding of the truth. This is the right, it is the opportunity for every human being. There's, there's no question as far as he's concerned that these universal ideas, a person comes into truth, that they make certain decisions, a person reaches this understanding of truth, even if he did not do it through any kind of religious command. What matters is that he espouses these ideas. According to Spinoza's understanding of the words of the Rambam, one of the last line of the first source in section three, the mitzvahs which are, according to his understanding, the Rambam, the Rambam's position is that mitzvahs which are performed because of one's own understanding, one's own deliberations alone, they have absolutely no value. They're they have absolutely no value. And this is what his wrath is poured out of, and it's understood that this was central to his new path that led in the direction of so much of modern philosophy that Spinoza has influenced. But here is the good bit. Here is the text of the Maram al Shakar of the Rambam. This is a different edition of the Rambam. And it appears in some early sources, and it appears in the, in the, in the Frankel edition of the Rambam, which is regarded in Shiva circles as the most um, accurate and comprehensive edition of the Rambam. It's a huge uh, 14, 15, really enormous thing, which I have downstairs in my house. According to the Maram al Shakar, Spinoza had the wrong text of the Rambam, and he designed his philosophy, poured out his wrath on what he regarded as a pathetic parochialism of the Judaism of his time, based on the wrong text of the Rambam. According to this, this is the correct text of the Rambam. If a person performs the mitzvahs of the Noah, this is talking about non-Jews, because of his own deliberation, this is still the same, He's not a ghetto shov. The aim of Chassidim Masolam, nor is he one of the pious of the nations of the world. Elo mechach mayhem. Elo. This word underlined is critical. Elo means rather he is one of their wise men. Note that the previous edition. I'm going to flip back so you can see it again. Velo mechach mayhem. Nor one of their wise men. That's the version that appears in most editions of the Rambam. But the version that appears in this edition, and we'll see in a minute what Rav Cook has to say about it. He's not, he's not one of the Hasidim, he's not one of the Hasidim or Masa'ulam, but he is one of their wise people. In fact, if you look closely, I may have called it one word that changed the world, but it's really one letter that changed the world. The Aleph at the beginning of this word is it's a vav, it's verlo, neither. And with an Aleph, it means rather a totally different meaning determined by one letter. Says Ralph Cook in a letter that he wrote in 1904. Fascinating perspective with which we will close. Where with respect to the pious, the righteous ones of the, of the nations of the world, about which the Rambam writes. Shim also Osam Behradas, Ainu Khasido. So we said if you if you perform them, if the if the non-Jews perform their mitzvahs because they decide they're a good idea, rather than because of a revelation through the Torah, they don't qualify. They are neither of the pious of the of, of the of the nations of the world, nor of their wise ones. He said, no, the correct text is he. Ella mechachmeim, rather, rather, he, this, such a person is one of their wise people. If they come to these ideas on their own, they may not be chassidim or but they are a wise person, i.e., 
they're in rather than out, the crucial distinction. But Dati Nota, and my, I'm inclined to think, Shikavonis Har Rambam, he, Shemalas, Yesh Lehem Chelet Lolam the Rambam's view is that the category of qualifying for a portion in the world to come, Himali Yerudamod is a lowly level. Afal Pishi Gum came to over, though it's a great thing. I mean, it's, it's, that's a, it's, it's a good outcome, but it's not a high level. Aval Kivan Shafilu Roshoyim, the Amir Orish of Israel, Zochinot. But since even wicked people and very simple um, ignoramuses amongst the Jewish people, they qualify for this. In the kind of, on the spiritual ladder, it's quite a low rung. For her Rambam sober, the Rambam holds. Ultimately, and this is borne out by many ways of the Rambam, the Rambam ultimately would like human beings to be contemplative, to live in a kind of, divine a communication a reverie to this degree the rambam is really an antinomian who believes that ultimately the purpose of observing the law were to get people to a place where they can contemplate and connect at an intellectual level with the divine that ultimately intellectual endeavor is more effective for people than simply righteousness in the behavioral world Therefore, he must hold that simply getting a portion in the afterlife, that's what Hasidi Omisa Olam gets. That's, that's the, the right, that they, too, they map together. Getting a portion in the world to come is what happens if you're one of the, of the, of the pious of the nations of the world. Shalogov and Muscolis, that's someone who has not succeeded, has not, has not been able to develop the intellect, the active intellect to be able to connect to God. Kim Chibai Muna, but to me, Levov, person just kind of accepted things because they are simple straightforward what you might call a posh a person a straightforward person there's no good with Eric Sean person behaves themselves in a they in, in a with integrity because they just what they've received they believe they get the mitzvahs they get on with it that's level one aval misha ali de hechra das but someone who threw intellectual endeavor Zochala Hasi Zion Mitzvahs B'nai Odom, B'nai Noach, is able to apprehend and comprehend these ideas, i.e. they work them out on their own through intellectual endeavor. For the Rambam, this is a much better outcome who the Emes Chochem Leiv Umolei Tavon, a person in truth, is a person of wise heart and filled with understanding, who Nesha Mechachem, such a person, is not just Umas Olam. He is one of their wise men, a higher level still. The, because the level as you, of wisdom is extraordinarily high. It is not necessary to say obviously he gets a portion of the world to come. He actually gets a, a higher and more spiritual level. It requires um, a more um, sophisticated and developed language phraseology than simply saying that you just get a portion of the world. Instead, you become one of their wise people. So you can see from Rav Cook, the Rav Cook, first of all, agrees that the, that the version of the text you see just above, the, uh, where it says just above Rav Cook, um, is the correct one. And this has fantastic outcomes. It has, first of all, the notion that someone, according to Rav Cook's reading of the Rambam, the notion that someone who through intellectual endeavor reaches God is superior from someone who gets it simply because they are commanded. And it fits with the Rumbum's, um, uh, if you like, the Rumbum's excitement and the dominance of his thought around the intellect. And it also fits very much um, with an approach which somehow now turns everything on its head and validates those people who come to this level of understanding. It's an interesting approach. But just imagine. Before I take a few questions, just imagine what would the world have looked like if Spinoza had the correct gifts of the Rambam? And he looked at this and he saw a person, any person, any human being who gains an understanding of God's will, how to live a moral life and gets that understanding through their own endeavor. 
is a, is a wise person, is connected to the system, has in some way superseded what it will be to simply receive this re revelation, i.e. through some kind of sense of eternal truth, rather than through revelation, he's in the same place as Spinoza says is the way the world should be. But instead it will be a critique of the Rambam and of the Judaism he left behind. It will have been an expression of it. So those are a few thoughts um, on uh, the two encounters of which text encounters of which I know that Spinoza had with classical Jewish sources, what he did. But then, as I said, the, the Ibn Ezra, it would appear that he possibly willfully distorted it. The Rambam said he's forgiven, perhaps not what he did with it, but he read the text as he had it, as most versions of the text would have had. But that just one change of letter radically transforms the, the Rambam into almost what Spinoza himself is saying about the concept of eternal and universal truth. Any questions? Oh, thank you so much, Rahan. That was very insightful. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can raise their hand, they can unmute. Yeah, we have one question in the chat uh, by Stefan. Uh, what does the handwritten manuscript of the Rambam say? This is not helpful. The answer is I don't know. I think the um, the Mifal, which works with the uh, Kafir version, does say the same thing as the um, as the one showed. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly by Ralph Cook's time, which is now you can see it's 120 years ago. These um, alternative versions were available, um, and so I, I'm not certain, but it seems unlikely that Ralph Cook would have validated the alternative text in, unless he felt that it was more faithful to the original manuscript. But I'm afraid I don't know for sure. And I'll ask, um, how much did the uh, did Spinoza really base his philosophy on? For example, the Ibn Ezra. Did he just have his philosophy and then he's like, oh, wow, look, secretly, this is what all the, all, the, all the Jewish scholars are saying. Or if he, you know, or was he actually moved by the Ibn Ezra? I'm fairly sure it's the first. He's, he's operating, he's come to this conclusion on his own. He realizes that he might be able to take members of the Jewish community with him by trying to demonstrate, in this case, falsely, that he has a strong support on one of the greatest commentaries. And that's why, that's why Shadal is so angry. Shadal is, he's, Shadal is generally very moderate um, and he has some quite interesting views of his own which are criticised by his contemporaries but here he goes absolutely to war with Spinoza because he's worried it's going to influence Jews who are reading it for the first time and he has to say it's false and so I think it's, I think it's very much the, the, what you said to, to start with that it's that he he this is his view and he's now searching around for support for support in classical Jewish text to it. I think uh, IP had his head up. Um, I see the Sahiba for Simon, which is the Mahon Mamre Rambam, which is Yemen, that has Ella. So that's good. That's that's good news for Rav Cook and the and, and the and so yes, so it does it. So it is so fascinating to see one wonders about sometimes huge amounts of effort going to explore manuscripts and maybe it's just to change one letter or tiny. Here, this change is absolutely earth shattering. Just one letter, which may, you know, in the end, whether we can really ever uncover the Ur text of the Rambam, the original text, who knows? But what we do know is that the difference between these two readings are is quite extraordinary. Uh, Danielle? Um, I think, yeah, in, in that light, um, I also think that um, Spinoza wasn't reading uh, Maimonides charitably, even with the uh, incorrect text because he would have noticed that um, the um, Goyim are still, still ha if they, if they, Bnei uh, Noach, they still uh, are not uh, damned, right? They still go to Olam Haba. They still have a portion of Olam Haba. So um, it's not saying that, you know, yes, that Judaism is so particular. I think that's right. I think he's, he, he, he is, he, he is, he is, um, He's an uncharitable reading, that's right. Um, but he, I think he's particularly angered by the idea that, that a revelation 
to which many people would never have access. And, you know, someone, you know, someone in rural China who comes to a moral position about the world is, and, and therefore a vast majority of the world at the time of the Rambam would be damned by this Rambam to never having an opportunity for spiritual greatness, even if they may minimally qualify. Um, it's an uncharitable reading, but it's not an altogether unfair reading. It does say you're still going to Olam Haba. It doesn't, it doesn't say you're not getting Olam Haba, right? If, yeah. if, if you're... Um... If you, if you come to the realization by yourself, it just says you're not a chacham, right? And it's, it's not very hard to figure I'm out. Not mechasid or mesaolam, that this is a kind of category of being sort of, I suppose, a worth. I think the Spinoza understands it means like being a worthwhile person, a person who's actually made a contribution. You're excluded from that. So, yes, I agree. It's an uncharitable reading. One could have read it in a, in a more favorable light. But nonetheless, the difference is very stark, even with a more charitable reading of the Rambam. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Going once, going twice, three times. Okay. Um, so I think that is it for tonight. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming. And uh, Rabbi Belowski, thank you so much. Um, it was very insightful, and uh, we hope to have you on many more times with us and to share your wisdom. And uh, everyone stay tuned for Sunday where we're going to be launching uh, the new curriculum, the, the announcement of the new curriculum and make sure to get that membership. Uh, have a great night, everyone.